going to today talk about personal minefields. Does anybody know what a minefield is? Well, of course you do. You know what a minefield is. It's a place where there is traps, right? And uh, there, how many know that the devil uses traps to try to always get us to do things that we know are not right? And, and the interesting thing is about a minefield, you don't even see the trap. You don't see what is there for you. It's below the surface. All there is is a little bit of a, of a trigger, and all of a sudden, boom, it's there. And you're all messed up. Well, today we're going to talk about how to avoid those personal minefields. Remember, a minefield has only one purpose, to maim or to kill. So Satan has placed all kinds of minefields to trap us. Now his minds, the things that he uses, is accusation, temptation, and deception. He's known as the accuser of the brethren, isn't he? He's known as the tempter, and he's also known as the deceiver. Don't think for a minute that Satan has your best interests at heart, because he doesn't. He has only one motive of operation. Jesus gave it to us so succinctly and so right forward. He said, the enemy comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Okay? So basically, Paul says, he, I, he says, I want to give you some advice on how to avoid these things. And so in this passage of Scripture, he exposes some of the minds that Satan uses. Now I want you to start, we're going to kind of go backwards here on this one. You say, what do you mean by backwards? Well, I'm going to start at verse number 11. Okay, that's where we're going to start. And then we're going to end up at verse number 8. Okay, so verse number 8, he says, he says, you may be sure that people are warped, sinful, and self-condemned. That is the state of most people. Okay? You may live beside one of the nicest people on the planet. You may think that they are wonderful. But let me tell you something. Anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior is under the control of Satan. They may be nice people. But you know what? They're still going to a lost eternity. And that is their reality. Now there are other type of people who are basically warped, sinful, and self-contained. Paul reveals, for example, that a divisive person is one who is warped in their thinking, their speech, and lifestyle. Interesting thing about people like that, divisive people, and you find them everywhere. You might find them in a work situation where all of a sudden you have an individual who just seems to bring controversy around them at work. They might be a family member. Have you a family member that just seems to be a drama king or a drama queen? And every time they come into the room or the situation, controversy follows them? Okay? They can be found in church situations as well. They are usually people that major on the minors and minor on the majors. Jesus said this about them. He says, they strain at a gnat and they swallow a camel. Now we happen to know that in Jesus' day, there was a group called the, uh, the Pharisees. Okay, And the Pharisees, they were very good at following the oral and written law, according to their understanding. Jesus described them this way. He said, on the outside, they look like beautiful uh, buildings. Or he used the word, mausoleums or whitewashed sepulchers. But inside, they were full of dead men bones. He said this, they would go halfway around the world to win one convert, and then they would make that convert twice deserving of hell as they were. Basically, what they would do is they would come along, and, and some of the things that they did with Jesus, for example, was Jesus was in a synagogue one Sunday, or one Sabbath, I should say, because it was Saturday. And Jesus um, was standing there, and he was about to heal somebody with a withered hand. And he knew that the Pharisees were going to get bent out of shape, because as far as they were concerned, you weren't supposed to do certain things on the Sabbath. And so Jesus says, let me ask you this thing. He says, 
Can we heal on the Sabbath or not? They didn't answer. So he said, stretch out your hand. That person stretched out their hand. Jesus made that hand well. And guess what they did? They got bent out of shape over the whole situation. There was a time where Jesus and his disciples were walking in a grain field on a Sabbath. And his disciples decided to help themselves to a few head of grain. You know what happens? They got bent out of shape over that because they weren't supposed to do that on a Sabbath. And yet Jesus said to them, He says, listen, you guys would pull uh, your donkey out of a, out of a hole if, you were in, if it was in trouble. What's going on here? You see, Jesus understood that divisive people, they major on the minors and they minor on the majors. They're so concerned about their opinion and what they see that they really don't care who they hurt and they really don't care about what's going on. They don't care if they're right or wrong. They just care that they're right. And you may be wrong. Have you ever ran into a person who said this? I think I said this the other morning, so I better not say it too loud. You know, you have a right to be wrong. Okay? You have a right to be wrong. And as, as far as they're concerned, you're always going to be wrong. So it doesn't matter what you say. You know, you may give them the facts. And you know what? The facts don't add up to them. You may say to them, well, two and two means four. Does it really mean four? Could it not mean five? You know, they're the philosophy students. What is truth? Right? So Jesus basically says they, they, have, uh, they have forgotten to love, accept, and forgive. They want their way no matter what or who it hurts. And they may not have started out this way, but somewhere along the lines, they something happened. I think that probably the same with, uh, we know the, the Apostle Paul. Here's a perfect example. The Apostle Paul really thought when he was trying to destroy the church, he was doing God's will. He really believed he was doing God's will. He said, we're going to destroy those, those uh, followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to do that. And yet, he had to have an experience where God had to knock him off his horse. Actually, Jesus Christ knocked him off his horse, right? And he had to have an experience where he literally had to be blinded for three days to understand that the way he was going was wrong. And there's lots of religious people. In fact, most wars are started by religious people. People who believe they're doing God's will. Right now in northern Iraq and northern Syria, there are people who believe that they're doing God's will. Now, their God happens to be Allah which happens to be a desert deity, but they believe by attacking and beheading that they're doing God's will. Okay? For a number of decades in Northern Ireland, there were Catholics and Protestants who were killing each other, maiming each other, uh, damaging each other, doing all kinds of things to each other in the name of Christianity. Let me just tell you right now, that's not Christianity, okay? That's very much uh, part of that. But you see, that's what happens. Now, I want you to look at verse number 4, or 9, he says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, and quarrels about the law, because they are unprofitable and useless. Now, the church of Paul's day, okay, was divided into major groups, okay? The Judaizers, they were the ones that stressed the fact that Christians not only needed to have Jesus Christ, but they also had to have Jewish laws and ceremonies and circumcision. And in fact, Paul infuriated them quite often. In fact, the reason why they had the council in Acts chapter 15 was there, but there, was, a, there was a report that Paul and Barnabas were telling the Gentiles that they didn't have to have circumcision and as well the the Jewish law. Well, when Paul and Silas told the <coughs> council and the people and the believers in Jerusalem what was going on, you know what the leaders decided to do? They said, we're just going to ask them to do two things. To eat meat not offered to idols and to keep themselves pure. That's what they said. They didn't put any type of um, uh, 
restrictions on them. They said, just believe in Jesus Christ and follow Jesus Christ and avoid idols and avoid meat offered to idols. Okay? That's basically what they said in that regards. Okay? The second group were what we call the Gnostics. And the Gnostics were the free thinkers. Now, there's nothing wrong with free thinking. Let me just put that very simply. You know, you may be a free thinker. You may say to yourself, well, I want to think outside the box. There's nothing wrong with outside the box. Okay? But these were the people who argued that G about who Jesus was. And also they were a group that said the body was bad and not good. This created controversies and quarrels. Churches literally turned into war zones, and that can happen today. When I went into my first church... I had this wonderful little old lady. Her name was Fern Brewer. She was 87 years old. But she had one little uh, idiosyncrasy. She believed that the only Bible that you should ever read is the King James Bible. Now, I remember she got a hold of me the first week when I visited her. I said, Mrs. Brewer, I said, you seem to be a wonderful Christian. And she was... She was giving me cake and cookies, and it was a wonderful time. It was a great visit. And then she said, Pastor, I want to straighten you out about one thing. Now, I'm only 23 years old. And so she says, I want to straighten you out. She says, the only Bible is the King James Bible. Well, at that time, that was the Bible that I was using. So there was never a problem with her. But one time in our Bible study, she was waxing eloquent about the King James Bible. Now you have to understand, Sister Brewer was as deaf as a post. Okay? And so that particular time she was waxing eloquent about the King James Bible. And uh, I piped up, it's the, it was the Bible that Paul used. And you know what? She said, right! And she just kept on going. <laughs> I, I want to tell you that uh, Paul didn't use the King James Bible, all right? But you see, people, there are lots of people out there who actually believe that the only Bible you should read is the King James Bible. Now, let me just tell you that. It doesn't matter what Bible you read. What matters is you read the Bible. Amen? Yes. If you happen to get something out of the King James, praise God. If you can do the these and thous and the thisers, wonderful. But if you're not, if you're like me and you like to keep it real simple, then I use other translations. I read all kinds of different translations, okay? But the point is, read your Bible. That's what's really more important than the translation or the paraphrase. If you happen to read the NI or some of the other Bibles that are out there, okay? Well, you know, Paul calls these type of things what we would call useless and unprofitable. It doesn't matter. You know, I've heard people sit there and argue with me for a half an hour on, on certain things. And I'm going, what are you talking about? For example, here's, here's, this is a real true story. There was a church in New York City that had just built this wonderful new facility. And uh, they, they, they got this artist to make a beautiful painting at the back of the church so that people could look at it. And, of course, he decided to make a whole Bible scene. And in the corner, he put Adam and Eve in the corner with tastefully um, put uh, fig leaves so that they would cover certain parts, right? And there in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, painting, he put Adam with a belly button. Okay? Now, we all know that the umbilical cord is, is attached to the belly button, right? But there were a bunch of people that got bent out of shape because the question was, did Adam have a belly button or not? Because he was the prototype of all men. So did he have a belly button? You know what? The church split over that. I kid you not. It did. Okay? One side, people saying, oh, he didn't have a belly button because he's the prototype of all men. And on the other side, oh, he must have had a belly button. The only thing I can figure is that probably God looked and said, oh, there's a great big expanse. Let's put a belly button. Boop, there right it. Okay? But you see, people can do that. And it's actually happened. Well, you know what he says? 
He says in verse number 10, Paul says this, warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time, and after that have nothing to do with that. Now that's very interesting. Why did he say that? You see, the strategy is how you deal with the divisive people. You warn them once, and if they don't get the message, warn them twice, and then have nothing to do with them. Now this is totally a different strategy than dealing with someone that you're in conflict with. Why is that? Well, we've already talked about, and I'll give you the, the first part was that these individuals are sinful, they're warped, and self-condemned. When you're in, a, let's say, a, a conflict with someone, the Bible teaches that there are certain strategies or certain things that you need to follow. For example, if let's say, for example, someone in the church offends you, then what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go and talk to them. Don't talk to me about it. I've had people over the years say, Pastor, you need to talk to so-and-so because we're in conflict. I'm saying, I'm not in this fight with you. This is, so, this is your problem. Okay? You're supposed to go and talk to them. That's the first step. Then, if you can't resolve the conflict, the Bible says, take someone with you. Now, let me just be very frank. Don't take your best friend against this person so that you can gang up on them. Don't do that. It won't go well for you or them. Because immediately you're going to have a problem. But what you can do is take someone along that both of you trust. Because the whole purpose of, of dealing with this is, of course, to resolve the conflict. Amen? Yes. And if you still can't resolve it, bring it before the church. Bring it before some, some men and women who have wisdom and they are able to work together and there's a resolution. However, if there isn't a resolution, sometimes there has to be a break of fellowship. That is how you do it. You start off by talking with someone, then you bring someone along who you both trust. Thirdly, bring it before the church and if you can't resolve it, then sometimes there is a, um, a break of fellowship. Because sometimes there are those situations that happen. But this is not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is a divisive person who is known to be a divisive. And there are people who go from church to church, situation to situation, and they divide. And they, they I, I'm not sure if they intend to be a tool of Satan or not, but they end up. What you do is you warn them once, you warn them twice, and then you say, hit the bricks, basically in my vernacular, all right? Because they're warped, they're sinful, and they don't have the church's best on, uh, uh, interest in heart, they want to conquer, they have an agenda. It's their way or the highway. Years ago, I was in a situation where there was a church that I was pastoring. I had just come in to be involved with that church, and there was a couple in that church that had been a problem for 25 years. Now, they had left the church, but they were friends of ours from Bible college. And so we went to the church, and we started pastoring the church, and they came back. And immediately that sent that, the board and the leadership of the church into total distress. They said, Pastor, you have to do something about this. I said, they haven't done anything. When they do something, I'll do something about it. Well, five months later, they did. And uh, now they weren't members of the church, so I did not have any obligation to, uh, because they came to me and they said, we want to do such and such. I said, no, you cannot. Well, they got mad. Oh, did they get mad. They phoned every board member and said, we demand a meeting with you and the pastor. I got phone calls that afternoon, and they said, pastor, what are we going to do? I said, what are you scared about these people for? I said, we don't have to meet with them. They're not members of the church. They said, Pastor, we need to deal with this. I said, okay, we will deal with this. We had one board member that had no history with them. And so we went into a, a meeting with these folks. And for 45 minutes, they went up one side of me and down the other side of me. They called me everything under the book. Everything. I said, are you folks finished? I said, they said yes. I said, well, and then I laid out the conditions that they could stay in the church. I said, that's the conditions. If you want to stay, stay with these conditions. 
You have some history. You've done some damage to the church. You need to sit for a while. They said, we're not going to do that. I said, then you have a decision to make. And they, and then in front of me, they started arguing about the decision that I'd given them. I said, you need to go home and talk about this. And you know what? I only talked to them for two minutes. After 45 minutes of talking to me about what was wrong with the church, what was wrong with me, I talked to them for two minutes, laid out what was going on. I said, you have a decision to make. Three hours later, they called me back and said, we've decided not to come back. 25 years of problems was dealt in two minutes because of the simple fact is of what I have shared with you today. I told them exactly what they had to do, and if they didn't do it, they couldn't remain in the church. It was that simple. I wasn't, I wasn't at that time trying to be uh, hard or unruly. I was being very caring towards them because I really want to see people come to a knowledge of the truth and to see what's going on. That's how I want people to be with me. If I'm doing something wrong, I want people to tell me so that I can repent and I can get right and stay right and not cause division or, or trouble wherever I go. And I trust that that is your uh, desire as well. But sometimes, whether we like it or not or believe it or not, you know what happens to us? We can actually become blind in an area of our lives. And when exposed to us, Instead of doing what David said, yes, I am the man, we put up these walls and we defend ourselves and say that's, that, that's not true. When the Holy Spirit brings something to our attention, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to get rid of it. Amen? We're supposed to confess it. We're supposed to say, God, with your help, I'll never do it again. And then, Lord, I receive your forgiveness. That's what we need to do when these things happen. Well, that's what D David said. Division can be very subtle, such as a murmuring campaign, or it can be dr dramatic as someone challenging uh, a leader's authority to lead. Either way, it leads to division. And again, I point out, as it says in verse number 11, these are warped, sinful, and condemned ways. Then, Paul says, this is how you avoid it. And this is where I want to focus for the next, the remainder of the meeting. Verse number 8 says this, This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who trust in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing good. These are excellent and profitable for everything. Paul says this, There are three things that you need to do to, be vo be, uh, to avoid becoming warped, sinful, and self-condemned. Number one, you have to trust God. Amen? you got to trust God. This is called faith. With your act of the will, you say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I may not always know what's going on in my world, but I am going to trust you. Remember, Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. God wants you to trust Him. Now, sometimes that's really difficult to do because the one thing that we know about God is we cannot see Him. Right? We can't see Him. We know He's out there. There's evidence of Him everywhere. I mean, all you have to do is look in the mirror. Why don't you turn to someone and say, you look pretty good this morning. Now, there was a reason why I asked you to say that. And that was simply because the Bible says that you are marvelously and wonderfully made. In fact, may I even say this, you are God's greatest creation. Think about this for a moment. Your brain, for example, has weighs about four pounds. And yet it has the capacity, according to, and I don't know where they get this from, but according to scientists, we have the capacity of at least a thousand terabytes in our minds. A thousand terabytes. That means that you are you have more capacity in that little old mind of yours than any computer right now that's been sold on the market. Isn't that wonderful? Okay? You've got more capacity than all of Facebook's um, uh, terabyte capacity. Your little old mind. And you know what? Your mind has, has the ability to control a hundred million functions every single second. 
Every single second, your body is fulfilling a hundred million different functions. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely marvelous. And while you're listening to me, you're also probably thinking of something else at the same time. That is pretty amazing in itself. Okay? Maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor, it's now noon, and my stomach is starting to growl, so you need to shut this message down pretty soon. Or maybe you're thinking, I didn't just agree with that last statement that he made. That's okay. You have a right to be wrong. <laughs> We are marvelously and wonderfully created. Amen? Yes. And that's where you and I can trust God. We don't see Him, but we see His evidence everywhere. Amen? Yes. When you look at a mountain, it's so majestic in front of you, you think, that is marvelous. That must be God's greatest creation. No, you are. You are God's greatest creation. You know, I was reading this week about about the ever-expanding universe and how that scientists tell us that the universe is ever-expanding. That just simply means that God is having some fun someplace else right now. But He can still have fun here. Amen? Yes. Because He is, of course, omnipresent. That means that He can be any place at any time, all the time. That is wonderful. And even though he may be off, off in the Milky Way saying, you know, today I'm going to make another planet, he's still concerned about your situation and what you're dealing with today. He's concerned about whatever you find yourself tomorrow. Amen? And yet he's doing something else someplace else. You see, time and space and matter and motion mean nothing to God. It's absolutely wonderful to know that he may be doing something else in somebody else's life, but he's still doing things in your life at the same time. Uh, to think about the fact that there are 7 billion people right now on this planet, and every one of us have needs, and yet God has the ability to meet all those needs, it is mind-boggling as far as I'm concerned. Yes. That's why we need to walk by faith and not by sight. With an act of your will, you trust God. You trust Him with your time, your talents, and your resources. You trust Him with your past, your present, and your future. You trust Him with your life and your family. You trust Him with your will, your intellect, and your emotion. That's what faith is. You say, God, I trust you. Maybe you don't trust everybody around you, but you can trust God. Secondly, He says, be careful. He says, be careful. Watch your thoughts, your words, your deeds, your attitudes, your emotions, your motives, and your reactions. What you need to do is you need to be disciplined enough to give no place to the devil. In fact, that's what it says. It says, give no place to the devil. Don't even let him have a toehold. Has anyone seen a cockroach? Of course you've seen a cockroach. Correct? Correct. They seem to get in places where you cannot even believe they could get places, right? There is a perfect example of what the devil is all about. All you need to do is give him a toehold, and what he will do is he'll get in there, and like a cockroach, he will multiply and reproduce. And before you know it, you have a mess. They've eaten everything that they can eat, They've spoiled everything that they can spoil. That's what the devil is. If you want to have an illustration of a devil, think of a cockroach. All right? Think of a rat. Think of the worst kind of animal. I don't understand why God ever created a mosquito. I think what Noah should have done was go like that. And that would have been the end of the mosquito problem, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, the simple fact is, be careful. Give no place to the devil. You know your adversary is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you need to give none of those things any place in your life. You need to guard your private world as well as your public world. Most of us are very good at giving a public persona. Most of us are able to, to project certain things about ourselves, right? Most of us are fairly good at that. But what we do in private is the real us. Let me tell you what Billy Graham did all his life. 
Billy Graham, as you know, is probably the most uh, successful evangelist of the 20th century. And there were always people that would have loved to trap, trap him up. You know what he did on a regular basis? Whenever he went into a foreign city and people found out where he stayed, he always had one of his staff members go into his hotel room before he even entered the hotel room to make sure that there was nobody there who wasn't supposed to be there. And that happened after every meeting. He would send a staff member ahead. And when the staff member had said, Billy, if it's okay, you can go to that place, he would go. Because there were many, many times that people in those cities would put prostitutes and, and different things there to try and trap him. There have been evangelists who have, have who, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Mark Buntain found himself in the city of, of, um, of Winnipeg, his home city. And he went into his hotel room and he found a brochure for, uh, for an escort service. It had been left there deliberately for him. He immediately threw it out and talked to the management. They said, we don't know how that got in there. Somebody had gone into his room previous to that. Now, he was wise enough to immediately report it to his people and also to the hotel so that there would be no accusation laid against him. How many know the enemy, if he can trip you up, if he can, he can tempt you in an area, he will exploit it to the max. That's why you need to be careful in whatever you do. Okay, Devote yourself to doing good. The expression of uh, being good basically means to be godlike. All right, devote yourself to a life of Christ. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Dorcas was so special to the church because of what she did. Barnabas was a blessing because of what he did. James says, "You say you have faith, show it by what you do. Faith without works is dead." William Booth, who was the was the uh, founder of the Salvation Army, touched his world for Jesus Christ. You know, my dad had such a high view of, uh, of the Salvation Army. I remember one time having a discussion. I said, Dad, what is, uh, this was after I'd gotten saved. My, I said, Dad, what do you think is the best religious group? What's the best Christian group? Because he knew I was, a, I was a, a Pentecostal at the time. And he, he says, well, he says, I don't know much about those Pentecostals that you've joined. He says, but I'll tell you. I like those blankly blank 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 Salvation Army blankly blank blank people. Now you have to understand, my dad had a very colorful language, okay? And I'm not going to use any of the words that he would say. You'd ask my dad about the weather. I said, Dad, what's the weather like outside? Blankly blank blank. Well, the blankly blank uh, uh, weatherman says it's going to be blankly blank warm and blankly blank windy and blankly blank this, blankly blank blank, blankly blank blank blank. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what's the best group? He said, obviously the Salvation Army, because they do some blankly blank, good blankly blank blank stuff to the people around them, blankly blank 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 blank. And I'm going, thank you, Dad, for that colorful dissertation. You know? Remember one time my son said to him, Grandpa, you just said a bad word. And now my dad had been dissertating for about five minutes about something. And uh, he says, what did I say? And I said, Dad, you said stupid. He said, you mean that blankly blank word stupid is the blankly blank word that Robbie's getting blankly blank all upset over blankly blank blank? Yeah, Dad, that's the one. <laughs> okay? The point that I'm saying is that my dad understood the concept of good, even though he was a very colorful character. Paul says that these things are excellent and profitable. When you're busy in the things that I've just mentioned, you don't have time to be warped, sinful, and self-condemned. You have a focus, and you don't have time for arguments and controversies or quarrels. I close with this story. Mark Montaigne, who for many, many years ministered in the city of Calcutta, I mentioned him a little bit earlier in the message. Mark had been called to the city of Calcutta back in 1949. And in the early years of his ministry there, he would be traveling throughout the city. And Calcutta, of course, was commonly known as the hellhole or the sewer of India. 
At any time in the city of Calcutta, there are two million children on the streets. Okay? That's where they live. Calcutta is a city of about 15 to 20 million people. Now think about this just for a moment. Two million people. That means the entire population of the greater Edmonton area, twice living on the streets in a city that is smaller in area than Edmonton. That's what we're talking about. And both him and Mother Teresa, of course, ministered in these cities. And Mother Teresa happened to end up getting a, um, uh, an award for that, which was called the Nobel Prize. And Mark Montaigne, well, he got a wonderful congratulations when he got into heaven in 1996. One day, Mark Montaigne was preaching his heart out to a series of people. And a man finally stood up and said, Preacher, you tell us about your Jesus Christ. He says, but our bellies are empty. We have no education for our children. We don't have any, any hospitals for our sickness. We have nothing. Before you have the right to preach to us, you need to give us something that will help us. Mark Buntain was challenged in his heart. He said, I took every word that that man said, and he says, I, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, made it happen. Yes, when we met him in 1982, the very first time, he was educating 35,000 children every single day in his schools. He had a 500-bed hospital that was number one in 30 years. He had built a hospital, the best hospital in all of India. People from, from the government were coming down to his, his uh, hospital. And folks, he was offering his medical services free. He was as well feeding 17,000 children every single day in his feeding program. He had schools and universities and feeding centers. And, and they would go out daily and find people. He had an emergency shelter. He had orphans' homes. He had everything in his complex. Why? Because he heard the voice of God through that man who said, You have faith. Show that faith by what you do. Paul said here, he says this. He says, This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress it, these things. Those who have trusted in God may be careful and devote themselves to doing what is good. Why? Because these things are excellent. And these things are profitable for everyone. My challenge to us today is this. We need to avoid those divisive people. We need to warn those divisive people. But the way that you, you can, can keep yourself from becoming one of those people is doing what Paul has said. By doing that which is good. By devoting yourself to God. Being careful of your lifestyle. And making sure that you are doing what it says in Philippians chapter 4, 8 and 9. Whatsoever things are good and right and pure and holy and praiseworthy and virtuous. Think about these things. And when you start thinking about these things, what happens is they begin to translate into lifestyle. Because as you think, you shall become. That's the challenge that I want to leave with you today. When we leave this place, we're going to head back into the real world. The real world can be very nasty. The real world can be very difficult. And there are many people who are going to need what you have today. You've got salvation. You have eternal and abundant life. And you have the answer. Isn't that wonderful? To have the answer? That's what you have. When Mark Montaigne heard that voice, he went and changed his world. Now, I'm not asking you to make a hospital. 
I'm not asking you to establish a feeding program for 17,000 people. I'm not asking you to become the leader of something. I'm just asking you to do what you can. So let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for today.